Welcome back, bookish people. It is your host, Liz, and this is E Reads Podcast, the place where I discuss authorship, books, and all things creativity. This week, I'm discussing rejection. I know the thing that makes us all cringe, but my guest, Kirsten Petras, does a great job of discussing how you can write through rejection. So let me tell you a little bit about her before we get into the episode. So Kirsten is a Brooklyn-based fiction writer, but primarily identifies as caffeine in a human suit held together by hairspray and sheer force of will. She has been published in Punk Noir, Hosier Noir, Alien Buddha Press, City Lights Theater Company, and A Thin Slice of Anxiety. Her debut novel, The Next Witness, was released in May 2022 by Cinnabar Moth Publishing. When not writing, she trains contortion and aerial hoop. She is also the co-host of Dark Waters, a literary podcast exploring all that is dark, dreary, and wonderfully twisted. You can find her on Twitter and check out her work on her link tree. So now that you know a little bit about Kirsten, let's jump into a quick ad and then right into the episode. Hey, puzzle people. I am here to tell you about Wongo puzzles. They are 100% wooden puzzles. They'll last forever. Each piece is hand drawn so no two pieces are the same and you'll discover some fun whimsy pieces as you work through it. They come in a custom wooden box that is perfect for storage and gifting. Some of the designs include animals, some that look like abstract art, buildings, nature. They have whatever you are into so definitely check them out. With stunning designs and unique shapes, Wongo puzzles are a cut above the rest. I loved doing the snow globe puzzle myself. It was great to pull out a puzzle and be done in a night and not have it on the table for a week. So what are you waiting for? Go to wongopuzzles.com and pick your puzzle today and be sure to use the promo code EREADSPOD10 to get 10% off your order. This is the most fun you've had with a puzzle guaranteed or your money back. Go to W-O-N-G-O puzzles.com and use the code EREADSPOD10, that's E-R-E-A-D-S-P-O-D-10, to get 10% off your order and get puzzling right now. Kirsten, how are you? I'm doing good. And you? I am doing good. I'm excited to have you in your cool cup with your spoon. (laughs) And so listen, I'd love to welcome everybody with a bookish question. So mine for you is, do you like happy endings or endings with a twist? And this question is (laughs) really relevant. I just ended a book with, um, a couple friends and it had an interesting twist and we were all over the gambit about how we feel about it. So for you, how do you like things? I don't like happy endings. I don't (laughs) know if with a twist is the right answer because the twist has to like make it fulfilling, Mm, but I, I'm not a big fan of traditional happy endings. Like I view the girl with all the gifts as having a happy ending. That's (laughs) as good as I go. (laughs) I love it. I love it. So yeah, I, I'm going to go with, I don't know, maybe just, I don't know if it's just like traumatized from real life, but like just ending with everything perfect in a bow just doesn't feel like something has to be off. You know what I mean? I, I yeah. love those endings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think the only, one of the few books I've read in the past, like I would say five years, because I don't read happy ending books all that much, is um, it's called City of Girls. I have it somewhere over Ooh, here. That sounds familiar. I don't know if I've read that one. It's by the same girl who read who wrote um Eat Pray Love. Oh, I've seen that. I have not read uh, read that. And it's not like happy happy, but it's like it's ha- as happy as I'm going to get. And this is very okay. like I would recommend this book if you want like real life version of a happy ending. Nice. Okay. So are your books like that? Can you tell no. us? <laughs> 
my books are horrible my like horrible endings I uh, my sorry to jump the gun on you um actually if, when I uh, when I wrote when I was writing my book I knew what the last line was going to be and I knew what I wanted the impact of that last line to be which was someone holding the book being like what the fuck is that and every, every review I think so far and there haven't been like too many but I think every review so far has more has mentioned the ending in one way or another as having a good or bad impact and I'm like cool that's exactly what I wanted like how is that so like you set up knowing what your attention is and then to have people experience that and and having that impact how is that for you is that like an endorphin rush like how is that I think for me I um and kind of before the show you and I were talking about like how long of a process it can be to write a book. I sat with this book and these characters for quite a few amount of years. And I think the catharsis of me finally finishing the book was the same level as what I wanted people to feel like reading it of just like, there is pain and there is suffering and the world is awful. Like <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> I like smile a lot. And my writing is just like, wow, this is a horrible person. It's fine it's such an interesting process writing a book right like it's just like so painful but you keep going back right and I think that's interesting about like even when books don't have a quote-unquote happy ending we still want more like we just go back it's just an amazing process and so can you tell us what has your journey been like so you mentioned um going through rejection and Tell us, what has that journey been like as an author? Yeah, so this story is a little bit complicated, uh, or I don't know if complicated is the right word, so I'm just going to go back quite a ways. Uh, I wrote the first draft of this book. Like The book kind of came to me uh, when I was a junior in high school. Really? Clearly was not written very well. I was a junior in high school. I wrote the whole thing in a month in my trig class. Like It wasn't good, right? So I kind of sat with it, typed it all up wasn't thinking about it. A couple of years later, I was like, hey, I wrote that thing. Let me go back and visit it. So I like kind of, I, you know, like through, it was the old thing called Create Space and you could kind of like get a cover and you could have like a proof version of whatever. Mm -hmm. So I printed up a copy and gave it to a couple of friends. They were like, this is awful. And I was like, okay, fair. And they were like, listen, it's not that the premise is bad. It's that you wrote it as a 15 year old and it reads like you wrote it as a 15 year old and you're not 15 anymore. So I completely uh, scrapped the book. Okay. okay kind of started over and then started over and then started over and kind of through that process was trying to figure out what my voice as an author was like, especially mm. with these characters that literally were growing up with me and the book kind mm. of gained character and gained age and stuff as I got older. And I wrote, ended up writing most of it during my, when I was supposed to be writing my master's thesis uh, a couple of years ago. And as you can tell, there's a pattern of procrastination. I have ADHD. <laughs> it just shows sometimes. Uh, but yeah, so I finally finished writing the story and I had a couple of people I sent it out to and they were like, you know, change this bit, change this bit. Nothing really was working. So I was like, okay, there's enough. Of, I think it's at a good spot now where I just really need an editor. So let's right. start sending it out. And gotten, And then I started sending it out in February of 2020, which was not a good time to be querying agents about a dystopian thriller with a sad ending. And if we don't remember what that was like, folks, we were like, what, at the start of COVID? It was the start of COVID was when I started sending out these things. And I could totally see like a, a lot of agents were just like, I'm not taking on things right now because I don't know. And then a couple of people sent me like really nice messages back and they were like, I don't think this is a bad book. I mentally cannot take on this project. And I was like, oh, that's so fair. Yeah. And I ended up having a few months after that, in like June of 2020, I ended up having a meeting with an agent and like, I don't usually like pay for that kind of thing, but I was just like, I am, I'm so lost of what to do right now. Um, and she was like, I think you need to change the title. And I think you need to rewrite some other pages. And I think you need to like kind of address this in a different way. And I was like, okay. So I did change the title. It was originally called What So Proudly We Hailed. Okay. And then I, I switched to ask you, has this always been the title, The Next Witness? No, it was. It was originally called What So Proudly We Hailed. 
And uh, there's a chapter about 20-ish, 30-ish pages in um, where it's people singing the old Star Spangled Banner. And that was kind of where that had come in. And um, I, so she was like, you should change the title. And so that was how The Next Witness came to be. And I think that that's a much stronger title, like good mm -hmm. on her. That was a good call. Um, and then I ended up doing, I like recorded the first 10 pages and then kind of played them back to myself and was like, this is awful. Like, I don't like, I don't, I don't mean, it probably wasn't like as bad as it is in my head, but I was like, and I remember thinking when I was querying, like, if they can just get through the first 10 pages, then everything after that's great. And like, you need the first 10 pages to be strong. So I ended up completely rewriting the first chapter. And then through that process, I also um, had been recording a podcast. And this was how I like got the first 10 pages was recording. It was, I started doing a podcast on dark fiction with my friend, Nate. Yeah. Um, and through doing the podcast, we interviewed a couple of people who are editors at indie lit journals. And I ended up getting my first short story published. And then once in my bio, I could say, I've had these short stories published at Punk Noir at City Lights Theater Company. I started to get more attention. And then that was, and then eventually once the title was changed, the first 10 pages were changed, it had a credit to my name. Then I got the offer from Cinnabar Moth. And the turnaround from them asking me for the full and saying, yes, here's our offer was about a week and a half. Whoa, whoa, so, whoa. So after, right, starting this in high school to, wow, that speeds up. Yeah. And that was like, and now I'm looking at the industry as a whole and people are like, oh, you should really like consider your first contracts and you should like negotiate this and that. And I was honestly just so like, I'd been querying for a year and a half. I'd reworked it so many times. I've had this story burning in my brain. I was like, someone is taking the chance on this book. I don't care. Just yes, whatever. Yes, I'm not waiting another year and a half of through waiting through another year and a half of no's. I just want this book out in the world. That, that is an amazing, and I'm glad you went and you gave us that whole entire journey because I think sometimes, right, even like, as writers, I know I sometimes can be guilty of this, right? You look at the finished copy of someone's book and you're just like, I'm never going to get there. It's never going to happen. And you forget all the back stuff that they went through, all the rewrites, all the rejections. And like, you got to remember like the finish, there's, there's, there's a story to the finished copy. And so yeah, I, I love that reminder. hundred percent. And I, ended up, I had an Excel sheet of all the agents of all the presses I'd submitted. And it was just a mass of red. I think it was something like 70 queries, 70 agent queries and published queries, maybe more than that. Maybe it was closer to 80, but it was a lot. And I honestly don't know, like, would this process have been similar if I'd started querying in like 2019? Mm. If I'd uh, waited until right. like, would that have been the same thing? But then would the story look as it does right now? Mm. And I feel like that's all part of the process is things have to happen in their own time. And this yeah. is just what ended up working out. And it took a while and it took a lot of frustration and a fair few whiskey bottles of <laughs> sadness. But <laughs> we know we got it out there. We got it out in the world. Well, outside of whiskey, how did you stay encouraged, right? Like, I know a lot of times folks talk about the editing process and how that can be discouraging. Um, but like through getting these rejections after you've done all that, you know, how did you stay encouraged to not give up? You know, I think a lot of it also had to do with the fact that it was the pandemic and I had nothing else to do other than work on this. And then in 2021, it was really nice because I just started a new job. I'd moved to a different city. Um, I was working on the podcast and writing was such a big part of my outside life because I didn't have like a big social circle, right? Like moving to a new city in the middle of a pandemic alone was not great for my social life. And like I figured it out and it was fine. But I think for the first part of it, it was also how do I use this opportunity to really build up, like just take a second to focus on myself and my writing career. And that was when I got the first things out. And that was when... Um, I got the stuff published in Punk Noir and that was, and uh, ended up writing a few short stories too, kind of along the way. So I think that part of it was the pandemic and having nothing to do and then taking the opportunity to really like focus on my writing side. I, I love up. that, right? Like having those wins to keep you, you motivated and keep you going. And, 
you know, tell us a little bit more about, you know, the, the podcast and about your book, The Next Witness. Like, uh, is the podcast kind of similar to the style of The Next Witness? Are they two completely things? Share us a little bit more about those. Sure. And um, so it's called Dark Waters, and it's a literary podcast focused on dark fiction and those who love to read and write it. And it, definitely, it's it's not the same format, but it's definitely tied into the book and the querying. And you were also asking like how I was staying motivated through this process. And that was definitely a part of it was my friend Nate has always been one of my biggest cheerleaders in regards to writing and everything else. And I love his writing. He was He's been one of my first like beta readers since forever. We've known each other since high school, too. And uh, he, so I was on a uh, panel discussion and I was so mad because they kept, it was supposed to be completely random and it was women's fiction, romance, women's fiction, YA, women's fiction, romance, memoir of like random chosen query letters. And I had been a part of these, like I went to this organization and I, to be fair to this organization, I don't want to like say I don't want to like completely dismiss them or anything like that I think they just were not a good fit for my genre in terms of what they do which is fair and there was kind of this whole idea part of what was coming up in the discussion was is this the correct time to talk about dark fiction and is this the correct time to do this and I was just like Nate what the fuck like what what are we what is going on and he went off on this because we were watching this together and he just went off and we were just like we're just gonna do it ourselves we're gonna do it ourselves and uh so yeah so it started with us going through our short stories and like things that were in progress and like chapters of books we were working on and then we'd bring in other indie authors or like other authors with works in progress and go through their stuff and then towards the end of i'm gonna call it season one um we ended up having an author that we interviewed and we had a uh, we did a couple of those and those were more popular so and then it just kind of became like as we got into more of this rhythm and kind of had more publications to our name it just kind of became that we were encountering more and more and more indie authors with new stuff right. coming out or things they wanted to talk about. So it became more centered on author interviews, but it's all focused on authors of thriller, crime, horror, noir, basically like dark fiction has a place in dark times because mm. it's been three years yeah. and the world hasn't been bright in a very long time. So I don't know when we can count it as like dark times are over, but like, yeah, I think so. Yeah. In terms of, how it fits in with my book, I think definitely just having that moment of I am so angry that there's, I'm being told that there's not a place for me and there's not a place for my voice. I'm going to create it. I need to find a way to create this space. I think the theme is like perseverance. Like you have just such great perseverance. You're just like, you're like, I'm getting this done. And like, again, like I feel really inspired and like, because again, this it's not a linear journey right There's no a not at all <laughs> right like anyone who's thinking not at all writing a book or who's in the thick of it right it is not linear right and I know you, you could always look out and the grass always seems greener but you are not alone right like your journey is gonna go and and so again like your mind is to have perseverance and and I love that thank you yeah and I think for me it's it is so easy to like what you were talking about in terms of like seeing the finished product, it is so easy to be on Twitter and be on BookTok and be on all these other social media platforms and just see people with like massive followings and like, oh, yeah. oh I just wrote this short story or oh, I finished this book and like people are just moving, moving, moving. And it's just like, I am not that speedy and I just have to own that, that I'm not that speedy. And two, I just keep having to remind myself that two years ago, I did not have a publishing contract. Come on. Yeah. Two years ago, I did not, I had like maybe one maybe two, I don't entirely remember the timeline, short stories out. And now I have several, we've interviewed awesome, like amazing authors. One of my short stories, like I understand that this is a thing that a lot of people get, but like one of my short stories was nominated for a push cart. Like I have to keep reminding myself really? that like I am so far from where I was two years ago. So mm. like it feels like I'm behind right now. It feels like just massive imposter syndrome all the time. And I just have to keep saying like it's part of it. It's just you got to just keep Come going. Come on, Kirsty. You better preach. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's so, really? yeah. I, I feel like if I just keep telling myself that eventually I will believe it and then somebody else will believe it and it'll be fine. And we'll just, we'll all be more mentally stable and it'll be great. <laughs> We'll believe it together, right? But like exactly. that goes into something you you had said um, before we had started about you know you asked me if I'm a writer and I was like ah, I don't know maybe sorta and and you 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 just talked about if you say it enough times it will stop being weird, right? And, mm-hmm. and that's absolutely true, right? If you say I'm going to finish this book, if you say I'm an author, if you say I'm getting that, like if you keep telling yourself, it's going to stop being uh, weird and it's going to be real. And I, I think that is such a great place to kind of like pause and just having that inspiration about, you know, it's going to happen. And like, again, like there's so much negativity, there's so much doubt, there's so many things. And so holding on to that. So again, thank you for that reminder. Yeah. Like I'm not, I I hate the word manifesting. Like I cannot do the look in the mirror and be like, I am beautiful and I am strong. I cannot do that. But I can look at a piece of paper and say, I am a writer. I promise I'm a writer. There are words in my brain that will come onto the paper. And like eventually that will translate into actual words on a piece of paper. Love it. Love it. Please tell us how do we find your book? How do we find your podcast? How do folks connect with you? Yeah. So if you go to, it's a link tree. So it's the link tr.ee slash the next witness. Um, that's all, everything I've published and uh, links to the podcast are all on that website. You can also find me on Twitter at, at Kirsten Petrus. And you can go to the Cinnabar Moth website for the book. You can go, it's available at Barnes and Noble, uh, Amazon, bookshop.org. Um, you can order it through any bookstore, probably with the ISBN. I know it's available through like indie catalogs. So it's pretty accessible, but the big two, Barnes and Noble, Amazon is definitely there. Fantastic. And y'all, if you missed it, please check out the episode notes where you can catch all of the ways to connect. Um any last words, anything that you want to leave us before I ask you my last question? Yeah. Um, as someone who has experience with both submitting and with editing, don't be discouraged if someone says that the piece is not for them because mm-hmm. there are three layers to it. It's not just do you as the writer like the piece. It's do whoever you're submitting like the piece and does whoever you're submitting to think that that piece is good for their audience. So there are three different parts to that, and all three have to align at the same time. And the chances of all three aligning at the same time are slim. So don't be discouraged if someone says, this just isn't for me right now. Mm. Keep going. Just keep trying. I'm going to keep going. (laughs) Yes, exactly. All right. My last question is, I, I love to ask folks, you know, for a prompt. It could be a word, it could be a phrase, but something to leave us with that we can use either in writing, cooking, art, music, problem solving, just in, in our creative process. Do you have a word or a phrase that you'd like to leave us with? I'm going to go with trepidation. Ooh. I feel like there's good stuff we could come up with based on trepidation. Oh, kind of dark, kind of think about some waters a little bit. So yeah, <laughs> start with something spooky, eerie. Right? I feel it. All right, listeners, if you want to hear how I use the prompt trepidation, stay to the end of this episode to hear what I do. Um, Kirsten, thank you so very much. It is a It was so wonderful. And um, I cannot wait to read the book and see what more projects I had for you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was great talking to you too. Thank you. The ship groans under the crashing waves. The waters beg for them to turn around, but straight ahead is their only option. Jim grips the wavering ropes attached to the flailing sails. The gusty wind and beating rain chill his bones, causing his teeth to chatter. It is a welcome excuse the shivering cold as it covers the fear that makes his steps unsteady. Captain, calls a crewman struggling to tie a barrel, threatening to crush anyone in its path. Aye, what is it, Jim calls. The crewman grows silent as the deafening thunder roars overhead. Jim's irritation swells. Speak, man, I have a ship to steer. The crewman swallows past the knot in his throat. 
we must turn away from this storm. The ship will not hold. Jim turns to the sea, then to the sky. He curses under his breath, fearful that the darkened clouds mean a torrential storm. The wisdom of pirate captain has taught him that storms of this magnitude never last long. Yet a storm does not have to be long to bring a ship to the bottom of the ocean. He looks to the east and sees a break in the clouds. When he fixes his gaze ahead toward their destination, he sees only storms. He stills himself, careful to remove any trepidation from his breath, and turns to the crewmen. Oi, tie down the barrels and instruct the lads to fasten the sails. This storm won't last long, and this ship is a sturdy girl. The crewman, though unsteady at the thought of traversing through the storm, nods. Jim fastens a rope around his waist, tying himself to the wheel. Squaring his shoulders, he faces the storm and all that lies beyond it.